<clears throat> all right, you're all set. Yeah. Well, hello. All right. Uh, hello, and thank you all for tuning in today. My name is Adam Olson, your host of Open Innovation Heroes, and I want to thank you all for tuning in. We are really excited about our special guest, Ambulance Health Innovation Agency, today. They're a company supporting senior managers and C-level executives in finding the right future strategy for their business, whether in workshops and coaching in health technologies to developing direct product or business strategies with a design thinking approach. Today's we're to Today, we are joined by Julian Wienert, uh, Managing Director of Ambulance Health, to discuss how they approach innovation and some of the fantastic projects that they've been working on lately. So welcome, Julian. Thank you so much for taking time to join us today. Before we get started, can you share a little bit about Ambulance Health Innovation Agency and what fires you up most about being part of the team? Thank you, and um, thank you for um, having me. And um... Yeah, I'm, I'm being present or active in the health sector for a little bit more than 20 years now. And um, since then, I found um, Ambulance five years ago, um, mostly with the focus on um, innovation in the health sector, like for pharma, um, pharmaceutical industries, medtech industry, and also startups. Because before that, I, I worked mostly in the um, healthcare marketing segment and realize that for most of my clients in this field, it's more interesting to, to get to know about how the game changes in the future and what are the, the relevant tricks that you need mm. to do to be one step ahead the competition. Um, so therefore, you need to be innovative in a way. And um, I realized that this is, has a much higher effect for my clients than... Um, just having good marketing and a good campaign and a solid campaign and strategy, because right. this is something that is offered quite common or quite often. And so I took the experience from before that and said, okay, now I want to focus on innovative projects in the health sector. Um, let's say five years ago, I, I, I did not know what I opened up <laughs> with this <laughs> and uh, that there are a lot of, sometimes strange projects and interesting projects came along the way. And um, I would say it was, it's really interesting because we support mm -hmm. clients from ideation creation, like the first step on what can we do, what are um, interesting ideas we can follow up to all the way to uh, through R&D, um, also clinical trials in some cases with partners and um, market access up to marketing and sales and internationalization to mm -hmm. um, give them the chance to go somewhere abroad. Yeah, well, you know, that's uh, similar to my role is the, you know, all of our projects are very interesting, different, uh, and exciting. I think that's like part of the fun of what we get to do working in innovation. You know, every, every project's different, every day is different, um, and you really get to innovate around some cool technologies and exciting things. Um, one thing that you said that stuck out to me is, you know, obviously kind of innovating to stay ahead of competitors. I feel like everybody relates to that in, in one way or another, especially with how rapidly uh, technology has been advancing lately. Um, how, how do you approach really trying to stay ahead of the curve and how does your team kind of tackle that for your clients? So what we, what we try to do in not normally, or let's say, in many cases, it doesn't work, but what we try to do is when we um, look at or when we are able to look at cases from clients and say, okay, what are the, the next steps in this market or in this segment? We make a prognosis about like a, a staircase model. We say, okay, mm -hmm. what are the next steps you have to climb to reach to some point in the future? And then we look at it to where we could identify clear cases where we see, um, let's say where we see that there are not so many other possible scenarios. Let's say mm -hmm. when they, when it's obvious that this scenario becomes realistic in a few years, then we can make a prognosis and say, okay, why don't we do we follow step by step? Why why don't we jump from the point where we are now and develop the solution that will come to place in four years from mm -hmm. now, for for example, or um, to be ahead of the competitors then. Uh, because we focused already on something in the future instead of making the next step in an iterative model. Um, so this is what we usually try to convince our clients from if they are not convinced already. But 
this very often is the hard part because when you when you look at it from a corporate perspective, for example, um, let's say failing is not so so um, popular. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's why in, in some cases it helps to have a um, to have an external support um, of someone who who can fail also, and it's in, for some in some cases for our clients it's easier to say. Okay, if we cannot do it, we have the um, agency or the, the service provider who right. failed in the project. This is also so it's very complex in some cases. What what does it need to make innovation happen? And also, we what we try to do is when we um, when we enter a field where where no one has been before globally, mm-hmm. um, which is in some cases the case. Um, then we try to identify the persons or people that have experience in a nearby segment yeah. so that we we have a project team that is, even though no one did it before, that is very close and has the knowledge that, that is needed to um, to also enter this new field. Yeah. Yeah, that that really makes sense. You know, it's um, it's something we do as well. Like I assume you're kind of referring to, you know, partnering with kind of subject matter experts and uh, things like that. Yeah, we we leverage a lot of those relationships as well. You know, when we're pitching on RFPs or putting together high um, high level proposals, um, you know, when we're kind of playing in areas where we're not so confident being able to have those experts kind of on our team it definitely helps to get that internal buy-in because especially when you're working with or trying to work with large corporates you know there's so many levels of internal buy-in that you have to get and um, anything you can do to move that along (laughs) and get some level of confidence uh, within the organization is certainly um, a benefit Um, so you mentioned that um, your company, you know, your, your start to finish, which I, I really like. I think, you know, we, you've spoken a few times about some cool projects you've done, starting with the ideas that you come up with. And I know you're very well known for the creativity on the front end, but then, you know, taking it from that all the way to market um, is, a, is a long journey. Um, what have been some of the notable projects you've been working on lately um, and some of the ideas you and your team have come up with? So um, I cannot give too many details of some projects because they are still in development and it's, and it's hard to, let's say in some cases, it's hard to, um, to explain what happens because it's um, confidential or IP. And, and in many cases for our clients, I guess it's the same on your side. So um, the, it's often uh, the question is, what is the value they want to generate out of an innovative solution? And in many cases, mm-hmm. it's, um, the value or the um, the currency they they take mm. is patents um, right. as an example and in some cases we're in a patent process right now so um, let's say for just to give some examples we we develop uh, in one case for example a medical device that measures or has a new way of measuring something inside the body mm-hmm. that allows us to detect things um, better and earlier let's say that the, um it is a device that a person the patient can take with him and use it every day because it's small and it replaces an mri scan so oh, wow. um the technology that is used today to detect the same thing or to get to the same outcome in diagnostics is an mri and we develop a solution that is capable of um, detecting the same niche Factor or segments through a wearable, um, which is um, interesting and and leads us to the to the point that we realized on this project as well that there is a big need in um, in uh, new digital um, diagnostics for many cases in the industry. So mm-hmm. um, there's in in many cases in the health sector we still have bottlenecks like. Uh, I don't know how it, how it is in uh, exactly in the U.S., but here in Germany, if you get to your to your, to your um, physician and he says you need an MRI scan, you probably have to wait a few months to get your MRI scan at the um, specialist. So um, yeah, it's uh, I'm not I, I'm in Canada, so I feel like it works 
quite similarly to Germany where, you know, we have the free healthcare system. So everything gets pretty backed up. Like I had to get an MRI a couple of years ago and I think I waited six to eight months just to get into, to see someone. So um, having something like that is um, revolutionary. I feel like in the States, it's probably a little quicker because, you know, there's a lot of like private clinics and, you know, you're paying out of pocket anyways. So it's probably a little bit quicker, but so can you describe this device a little bit to me? Cause I'm thinking, you know, I've had to get MRIs on my knees. Um, you know, people have to get them on all different parts of their body. Like, but you mentioned it being kind of wearable. Like, is it just something that you can. It's, let's say it's, a, it's something that you can adjust on several parts of the body. It's okay. sorry. I, I cannot go too deep. Okay. <laughs> That's fair. Getting too, but, but it's, it's um, let's say the interesting thing is it can, it can be very effective for the patient on the one hand on the one hand mm -hmm. side and on the other hand it, the interesting thing is for the industry let's say if your um our client is um operating in the pharma industry right and they have a product in this niche segment let's say if for example if you develop in the uh, future treatments like genetic treatments um you have to do new ways or have to identify new ways to make clinical trials as well to prove that the genetic approach is successful and um right these devices also allow to um, to increase the measurement points or data points that you generate by um, just making it a lot easier to um, make a valid um, valid measurement at, at one point um, mm. instead of MRI, which is really a bottleneck. So this is just one thing where we we are working on right now, and um, we work on other projects where we try to identify um scenarios and solutions to improve rare disease diagnostics mm -hmm. let's say as an example in germany for many patients it's very hard to um, get diagnosed correctly when you have a rare disease like one in a hundred thousand cases for example and it's so complex that um we have very different scenarios like physicians say um, I do not, I do not, even though if I know the rare disease that it can be, I do not believe that this is the one in a hundred thousand patients. Mm. So I try to treat him as, as if he, he is not to make a, uh, let's say to, to see whether this treatment is successful. And if not, then I, in the second step, I will try to find out whether it's the rare disease. So it's very complex and there are many biases. Uh, so we work on on identifying technology solutions that could help um, diagnose rare diseases earlier. Um, we have several projects on digital biomarkers, which is mm -hmm. um, that um, we identify um, yeah, algorithms that are able to detect um, various um, uh, diseases, for example, or, or identify treatments. Uh, and then for treatments. And um, also another case is that we um, just refocus on, we were active in the, in the past in the in this segment, and we said, okay, now it's a more interesting time to go into the automotive health direction. So, um, which is a very big field because it has a lot to do with What's happening inside the car and how, what can you do to activate people or patients or drivers and mm. help them to live more healthy so it's a mix between health and well-being going to the next step to prevention and detection of diseases and so on well, yeah i remember uh you mentioning to that uh that's to me if few months ago and I thought that stuff was so cool so uh, I'd love to talk a little bit more about that obviously that's something you know like in the future for you but I'd love to get your your thoughts um, and opinions on kind of where we're going with that because you know everything like that that AI technology autonomous driving everything is just seems like it's coming at us so fast and um, to your point you know it's like your car is such a huge computer. It's got all these different uh, opportunities for sensors and different ways to, um, you know, give diagnostics on, on people. So where do you see that going and, and what, like, you know, what, what does it look like in the next five, 10 years with, could you get in your car and it could, you don't even need to go to the doctor anymore or, or what does that look like? 
So, so personally, I, I believe this could be a very realistic and, and good scenario. For example, when we had a look at it, when um, I give you one example, when, when COVID started mm-hmm. um, in Germany, and I don't know exactly how it is in North America, but in Germany, when uh, we had to uh, test ourselves several times and get certificates to, mm-hmm. um, to somehow were able to leave the house and go somewhere and meet with other people. And so all, all the, kind of more oh, yeah. regulatory stuff yeah we had so, to jump through those hurdles in canada as well i think it was it's definitely different like province oh. by province or state by state but where i was we were doing all that as well yeah. so it, it was okay and and everyone did it but as as long as it um as the process of COVID was um let's say people became more and more um yeah, let's say more and more dislike these processes. I, w- mm. I would say so. Oh, um, sure. <laughs> yeah. So um, we came up with the idea: why why can we not somehow automate a process that makes it a lot easier uh, through a medical device that you don't need to go to a test center because we need to go to test centers, make an appointment there, get your swab and stuff, and then get the test results afterwards. So. Um, we realized that there are there are companies in Germany that have a patent and solution for um, breath gas analysis wow. that allowed the analyzation whether you have COVID or not through a valid test with a clinical trial. So they validated that this is valid yeah. um, in the same quality than the the lab test that that you make. You can analyze it from breath gas. So we thought. Could we implement something like this into a vehicle, which um, cycles the air inside the vehicle several times and detect wow. maybe in or build a case that says within 10 minutes inside a vehicle with this detection system, we can come to a um, negative result. Right. And the vehicle can, can start an automated process to send you your um, negative certificate on your smartphone, for example. It was just an idea, but this, um, but it's a realistic case. So it was, um, we checked it with everyone involved and came to us to the point that this is a realistic case, even though mm-hmm. we were too late for the COVID scenario, we realized that with the technology that is also capable of detecting other molecules besides COVID, um, this is, can be, can really be an interesting case to detect detect diseases or other things when um, the vehicle owner or driver is is interested in using this technology just yeah that that's that's so cool uh, my mind kind of goes to you know when you're thinking of uh, sort of the regulations that are going to come as autonomous driving becomes more um, you know common in society but obviously you know you wouldn't want someone getting drunk and then jumping in their car and be like, that's fine because they can drive me home. Like, would that um, system be able to kind of detect um, blood alcohol levels through kind of like a breathalyzer? There are also systems that that can do this. Yeah, uh, definitely. And I think there are also interested, let's say when when we have autonomous driving, I don't know which country and where (laughs) they will make the first step. Yeah. But I think the interesting thing is that this can solve a lot of other things. I don't know how how long, for an example, the people wait in North America until they, an ambulance reaches home when you call 911 or something mm. like that. So um, it would be, would be easy to, for example, if the elderly lady has an, an emergency case, she just goes out the house and jumps into the next vehicle and the vehicle drives her to the hospital. Right. So um, if she's still capable of doing it, but but this um, I think in many, for many cases. So in Germany we have many of these cases where people uh, during the nighttime or at the weekends need medical support and they don't know exactly whether it's critical or not critical. So it's better to to call an ambulance and they are they are um, busy. Let's say and, mm. and it takes in some cases it takes more than the twelve minutes that are allowed. So. It can this can save a lot of time when you just jump in, in a vehicle but on the other hand i think this also goes the other way around so when we have autonomous driving and the same el- elderly lady steps into the vehicle in let's say in boston and mm-hmm. um 
um, drives to New York, for example, um, and reaches reaches their dead in the vehicle. Right. It's the, had a heart say, attack or something is, along the way. Yeah. Serious problem. So the, the yeah. manufacturers or OEMs need to, I think they, they will be forced or need to buy uh, and build solutions in the vehicle that are able to detect what's happening inside the vehicle. So right. from from this case, I believe that there is no way around um, detection systems inside the vehicle for health detection. Mm-hmm. Um, because no one would like to have this case in PR or media and, and, oh, and God, read no. that, that and in his vehicle something like this happened and because of the lady could not get out the vehicle or the vehicle oh. didn't stop and didn't detect it. And um, right. uh, so I think there are really various cases and um, just when you when you have a closer look about the, uh, around the emergency case, which is just one small topic of this, for example, I have another case when when the vehicle detects an emergency like heart attack or stroke or something like that, um, and can can make a stop on the highway and drive on the on the on the side. So we we just realized that there is no no common signal that mm-hmm. um, that signalizes other people in their vehicles that there is an uh, a driver having a problem. So right. in Germany and in Europe, we only have a signal that signalizes that the vehicle has a problem somehow. Yeah, like hazard lights. And or... in, yeah. And in many, many cases, the case is that um, they went out of gas or they have a mechanical problem and they they just park on the side of the highway and they wait to get their support. So in many cases, I would not stop because I could not help some somehow. Right. So. But if I would see or if I would realize that there's someone in the vehicle having a medical problem and needs help, this would definitely trigger another effect. So um, right. um, people could help and pe- people could support. So there are, there are many, many cases uh, leading up to a point where in the auto- autonomous driving vehicle could also detect the case and then directly bring the, the person inside the car to a hospital, for example. Mm-hmm. Which, which in Germany, I don't know how this is in, in Canada or US, but in Germany, this also is a business case because you can have um, all the ambulances really take some serious money for driving someone to hospital. Right. So yeah. um, there are many cases just around the emergency stuff in the vehicle, but there are also a lot of cases around just like from from um, detection um, of diseases and detection of the surrounding. The interesting thing is that the vehicle always has the same, let's say the same surrounding and can measure it. Like when it's when it's cold, it's different in your vehicle than when it's hot, but the vehicle knows when it's cold outside or when it's, right. when it's hot. So you can measure body temperature and, and all kinds of relevant parameters. So, um, you can even have a medical telemedical treatment while you're driving, maybe. Yeah. So, um, because the vehicle can can deliver relevant data to the physician. So, that's that's so incredible. You know, I, I think this just just your comments on this really speak wonders for I, I think the the mentality and the, the the culture that you and your team have, where it's like. I feel like a lot of people can see the next exciting technology, you know, the autonomous driving and then and what's up and coming, but then the way you think is like, okay, well, what's after that? Like what, what else can we add on to it? And I think that's really exciting to, to kind of hear your thoughts on that. Um, back to the, the, your comment on kind of the length of ambulance times. Um, I, I see a huge need for that. I think across North America, and obviously you mentioned you're experiencing it in Germany as well, because where I am, there's such a huge shortage of nurses. So they have in place now that if an ambulance brings someone to the hospital, if there's no bed or no one to care for them, the ambulance drivers and paramedics have to stay there with them. So ambulance times Ooh. right now are outrageous. I heard it was in the news uh, back in the fall that um, a high school football player broke his leg and laid on the field for two and a half hours waiting for an ambulance. So... Ooh. Yeah, like okay. I think there's an enormous need for for something to happen in that industry, and I, I think the the idea of of using this technology to do so is really exciting. Um, 
but then you know as well your comment on kind of liability and, and someone like dying in in a car and, and sort of manufacturers having to uh, you know protect themselves by putting these sensors in the car i i always think about apple watches and, and smart watches and how how much they're able to test and 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 provide like what diagnostics they're able to provide um, so i feel like it shouldn't be overly difficult for manufacturers to implement some of that basic technology wouldn't you say let's say that the difficulties they are facing as car manufacturers is medical device regulatory mm. so they have the in many many cases you need really high standards for developing a medical device so what they what they would do and what we recommend to them is partnering in the first step and the difficulty we're facing in the whole industry is right now that the oems and car manufacturers they don't have a strategy for automotive health or a real right. strategy so and as long as they don't have a real roadmap where to go to the um the companies delivering solutions to them don't even know what to produce and what to um invent and what to do there so it's a kind of um a little bit of a vicious cycle that you be like mm, what's where is it going and what's yeah. happening and everyone waiting for the next step right. so but i think as soon as at some point this next step happens it goes very fast so right. because when when coming back to apple and other wearable solutions and um many manufacturers of vehicles right now have a let's say Maybe it's not a strategy. It's more a, a plan that uh, bring your own device. So people bring your own device to the vehicle. They can connect it and they somehow can use it. But there is no real strategy from the vehicle manufacturer's perspective. So right. um, because the interesting thing is when you would like to recommend things to your um, car owners or people driving with the car, you need to have a bigger picture of what they do during all the day and not only during the time when they sit in your vehicle because you can only interpret let's say having a person sitting two hours in the vehicle per day or four hours yeah you don't even know what this person does during the rest of the day maybe she's very active or he he or she's very active so mm -hmm. or maybe not so it's hard to interpret so um i would i would really recommend car manufacturers to manufacture own wearables where they have access to all the data during all the day uh, which is interesting i think and um, on the other side it has a relevant aspect because for diagnosing some um, some diseases you need various parameters like heart rate breath rate and and some more to make an accu uh, accurate diagnosis and in some cases, the smartphone only or wearable only approach doesn't work. Right. So to make a good diagnosis, you need more parameters that the vehicle provides. But the question is, who will be the one? So will it be Apple or will it be Daimler or who will be the one who, who will be able from the data they have to make a diagnosis? And I think this is a really interesting question. Who, who will have the power to to make such such a strategy um go live yeah really bring it to life oh. and, you know uh, data data is king these days right <laughs> definitely so yeah and it's it's very interesting so when i speak to to vehicle manufacturers most of them still think ah we have big servers and we collect all the data which is in germany or europe gdpr compliance is a very big thing so it's mm, tricky and, mm. and i said I think I don't know if the consumer is really willing to have all the data on a server, but the best solution would be have it on on a wristband, which is the wearable, mm -hmm. wh which can store all the data and have it like a a kind of redundancy data backup inside your vehicle, so that you have mm -hmm. um, you have a backup and you have um, the collection of the data, and then at some point in the future. When, for example, another company develops a digital biomarker for thumb disease, you can even get a kind of retrospective analysis of your data to identify whether you have the problem there, which which could then be an interesting monetization case. 
or monetization right. case also. So, uh, so cool. there's a lot of potential, but um, we will see what will come to life there and and what yeah. to, what won't. But um, I think it's also it's also difficult to differentiate um, professional drivers and um, let's say um, yeah the normal consumer driver or um, right. yeah public driver so yeah yeah it, it sounds depends. like there's uh, there's quite a few things that need to happen before you know we can even really start innovating around these technologies but you know it's always good to be thinking multiple steps ahead right yeah so i think it's these are these are things that will come but we do not know when when they will come so um yeah and this is very often this is this is what we try to prognose in our projects and where we we work uh, on getting the next steps done so that when this happens, the companies or our clients are ready for making the next steps and they have a strategy or a setup that allows them to be become able to implement solutions like that. So right. Very exciting. Um, so maybe I just want to take a step back kind of to the you know the projects that you currently have on the go and um, you know, like what, what's your kind of time frame? I know it's pro you're probably in the same boat as we are, where every project can be so different. But you know, where you're taking it from end to end, um, I feel like that's you're working with your clients for a really long time. Like, what's what's your average sort of lifetime? So it depends on on. Let's say we have some clients that jump in in a in a more later stage, but mm -hmm. we also have clients that jump in or that start from the very early stage. But they they do not in in some cases they do not go all the pathway with us. So okay, because um, for example, there are cases where we see that that the, the knowledge that we can bring in and also the project management we can we bring in is mm, let's say not a relevant uh, success factor in some right. cases. And then we we also say okay, we recommend to hand it over or to to take it out. So um, but most of the cases projects go two to three years something okay, like yeah. that because let's say for a medical device development sometimes longer and when we have clinical trials or yeah. um, um other things that need to be done so let's say in one case we we tested things from in vitro or from the idea to in vitro testing where we analyze the things and then to um animal testing which is becoming more and more difficult but you need it in some cases so even though i i think it's, it's you have to look at it very critical but in some cases you, you need to to go mm -hmm. this way um and then human testing and so on so it's it's complex yeah but be um, it takes some time yeah and but what i realize is that um in most of the cases, the decision to to make an innovative project needs to be in the beginning and happens in the beginning. So I rarely have the case that a client says, I do want to I, I want to do the project and I want to do the innovative thing. And then somewhere on the way, he said, oh, I'm not sure anymore. We only I think we never had this case. So that's good. And in, in the in most of the time, the decision happens in the beginning. And yeah. must happen in the beginning. So, um, and what we try to do is that we try to to um, show the whole case until the final product or the final solution that we um, propose in the strategy, and then, um, but then make it make iterative steps. But after each and every step, we can make a decision and say, ah, oh, we want to make this different or that different, so that we are still flexible, like like a kind of long-term scrum process something right. like this yeah. I, would, I would say um and yeah but most of the projects are really long-term projects oh. yeah well i i certainly agree with you where you know building that foundation out of the gates and clearly defining steps and outcomes and what success looks like is can really make or break break a project and, and that's you know why we put such an emphasis on supporting our clients in challenge design and getting um, you know, that, that foundation set up to, to really make sure the crowd knows exactly what success looks like for them. Um, 
I know you've mentioned that you leverage a lot of partnerships um, throughout this long-term process. I can't imagine you're doing all these, you know, clinical trials in-house. Um, so no. could, you share, <laughs> could you share a little <laughs> bit more about, uh, you know, how you leverage your partnerships, like how much gets done in-house and, and um, you know, like where, like kind of where you step in and where you step out. I'm sure it's different for project to project, but. So, so for, for us, for us, it's very much, we have the project management in-house mm -hmm. and we have most of the, the, let's say the deep dive expertise is uh, from the network. So um, I would say we have a in-house, a good overview on, on the whole health market and health innovation market, but no deep knowledge with some, uh, with some exceptions where um, maybe there are some projects from the past where we uh, had a deep dive or, or something like that. Right. But in most of the cases, we try to identify the persons with the, the best knowledge in this uh, yeah, in the segment and therefore we work with startups but also yeah. with with um universities so just as an example um the typical case for for us is as soon as we identified um the idea or clarified the idea and the goals with the client or in some cases um and we also have very often have cases where not the client gives the idea but the client's customers give the idea so we do the workshop yeah with the customers of the client, like whether it's physicians or patients. And then we identified a realistic ideas that the client can handle to, um, to bring to life. And then we try to, um, even in some cases when there is a, let's say a um, uh, ridiculous sounding idea that is coming out, then we pitch this to universities and say, okay, look, what, what kind of approach do you have or would you, identify in your team with your expertise to solve the problem mm -hmm. we pitch this to startups and universities and then they come up with their solution um trying to um let's say to become part of the project so they it's right. like a um a yeah pitch process where they um they come up with ideas so we we collect ideas there already and identify and screen what, what sounds valid for us and have a second group with experts that are very much closer to us and they review the, the external ideas and then mm. they come up to a solution where we see, okay, what can be a realistic scenario that helps us to get a product to life? And then we stuff the team and build up the team and go and enter the project. So right. that's, that's really interesting. Um, I feel like that um sort of walked a very similar line to you know the prize challenges and in, in the crowdsourcing that we do at hero x like obviously you're a little bit more focused on you know it seems like the pitch competition but let's say you know one startup won the pitch competition is like it's kind of like the prize or what they're winning like the contract to work with you or what do you like yeah. what do you do to entice yeah. them so it's yeah. not it's not like a maybe maybe my my english is not too good for that but <laughs> it's not like a prize so we we would we already say in the first step, okay, this is the briefing. This is the solution we are developing. And we already give them some, um, like a service fee for developing ideas. Okay. For so that. you're paying them up front. Um, yeah, yeah. For, for getting ideas for that. I think this is nece necessary and, and makes it more, um, um, more trusted working yeah. together. So because they invest time and, and we pay for their time, they invest. Yeah. And uh, in some cases, one team says has the better idea than the other team. But I would also like to work um, together with the other team in the future because maybe they have the a better solution in the future. And it's not like um, we post something online and the, the people can can come in and try to reach to us. But we right. have a expert network and we try to or we go out or we reach out to them and ask whether they are open to to give their input so it's more um that's why i think it, it only works this way around um yeah that, know, that makes sense for the, uh, the things you're doing are so highly technical like you've kind of built your own network of you know trusted startups that you kind of know what they're working on yeah and um and in, in many cases it's easy to approach universities because they mm -hmm. are very open to identify new new um projects as well 
through this channel. So um, this also helps a lot. And um, yeah, then it's a good way to to move on from from there when we identified the team. And uh, normally with the client, we have then uh, the project is structured like um, in a way that the client pays the process of the development or the research or what's going on to identify the um, innovation or make it happen, plus a management fee, plus a success fee for patents or for right. things that happen along the way. And um, this is the way we structure projects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, I feel like the business world is just becoming more collaborative and open. Um, I manage our partnership ecosystem at HeroX and, you know, we leverage a lot of different partnerships to, to make sure our clients are served as holistically as possible. And it sounds like that's exactly what you do to make sure you're providing the best service possible. Um, you know, if you can't, can't do it in-house, you know, there's, lo there's lots of organizations out there that uh, are collaborative. Yeah. So that's fantastic to hear. Um, I know this isn't uh, necessarily your primary wheelhouse, but I know like this AI, chat GPT, everything has been, it's like so hot in the news right now. And I'm sure it's, it's been on your radar in one, one way or another. So I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on if there's something exciting that you see um, impacting the health industry or up and coming um, with this new technology, because it feels like every, every day I'm seeing something else new in the news of what job it's taken or what what's going to be happening. So um, do you have any insights on, on AI? Yeah, I think there are many, many, many solutions that can can AI can support with in, in the health segment, even though um, the cases are very complex normally. So I think there's a real or a good chance that AI can solve this rare disease diagnostic thing in the future mm -hmm. in a good way. But there are also solutions. So we, we come along a, a, a case when we um, looked at the, what's happening in, inside the vehicle, just as, as an example, because we also had a look at, at mental health solutions and what can be done there. And so, and there's this, I think, each and every driver knows this typical case from being in a big, big city and being stressed by the traffic um, to the total opposite of being somewhere outside of town in a lonely street, getting tired after a few days uh, or a few hours driving. And um, so the interesting thing we look at is that, that um, let's say verbal interaction with a speaking vehicle. Mm. Um, could um could enable us to to keep the driver in a kind of um state or or a mental state or or mental flow state that allows him to be active and 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 um awake uh without getting tired and so this is very interesting and i think we 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 learned through the last 15 years or 10 years i don't know how for how long we have we have books we can listen to while mm -hmm. driving and i think the next thing would be like interactive um books where we can um work on and speak to the vehicle or speak to the, the let's say book uh, or or audio book and that trains us content through a completely new kind of educational service and um, i think this is very interesting so this is something where AI also allows um, allows voice modulation so that the vehicle or the the um, the voice speaking with us can be angry or louder or more gentle mm. and and so on. So I think this is very interesting. That's so cool. Um, you know, I love listening to audiobooks, and um, you know, the types of books I usually listen to are either business focused or I love. Um, you know, people's stories. So I just recently listened to the Matthew McConaughey book and it was fantastic because he was reading the book to me, but I couldn't imagine being able to listen to that book and then ask him questions and the AI make it sound like Matthew McConaughey is responding to me. Um, and then on the flip side, if you're, you know, listening to educational books, being able to like stop and ask questions, it's almost like being in a lecture or in an actual classroom. Yeah. Or having really cool. a personalized trainer or something like that. So yeah. um, 
this is really, really, I think this is really interesting. And I think we're very close from the technology perspective of being able to making this happen. So, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Man, I'm, I feel like I'm going to be bored just listening to my audiobooks now. <laughs> I'm going to be trying, <laughs> sitting there trying to ask them questions. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm just, it's something I'm excited about. I just had, uh, did an episode with somebody who's um, really um, involved in uh, innovating uh, in the education system. And obviously AI is having some huge impacts on both the the learning and the teaching side of that. So it's, it's top of mind. And I love to, you know, connect with people in different industries and see and learn what their thoughts are on how this is going to play a part in their, their industries, because, you know, it's going to affect every industry in one way or another. Yeah, I think so. I think so too. So I think it's in, in many cases or very often it comes to me like, we're talking about innovation in so many different industry segments mm -hmm. and um, leads to a point where in some, in some segments there, there will be a point where the system tips or, or is it, can I say tips or, or yep. changes or, and, um, and then we will have a completely different framework. And, and I think we're very close to this in the health sector where um, technology will enable a lot of new things mm -hmm. um, from diagnosis to, let's say, decision support when it comes to the to choosing the right therapy for this or that patient up to having all kinds of genomic data and allowing technology to, to find the best solution for you as an individual. So there are so many segments where innovation can help to find better solutions. And I think this is something that we see all across various industry segments where mm -hmm. we're very close to, to the point where technology opens up a completely new field of um, solutions. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree with that. It's a, it's scary, but exciting all at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I know you. I know you're extremely busy, and I don't want to keep you too long. Um, so I guess we can kind of finish up with that note. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation, uh, and I really look forward to seeing all the big ideas and the the products and that you and your team bring to life uh, over the next few years. I know you mentioned um, previously when we spoke about the roundtable events that you host in for in Germany for health tech. Um, maybe if you, before we sign off, you could just share a little bit about that in case some of our listeners might be interested in attending in the future. Sure. So we do regularly host um, community events to to build up um, or yeah to build up a strong community and um, accelerate networking. Um, where I think it's very important for us. And, and I like to bring people together because it needs um, connected people to, to build clever solutions. So this is what mm -hmm. I think, and this is what we, we also live in our company and why we work as the way as we work. And um, yep. so um, if someone from, from your side of the uh, ocean <laughs> is... Uh, interested in joining in uh, you're well very welcome and um so we're also planning to to host um this year an automotive health um round table where we invite um relevant people from the german automotive industry that are interested in in amazing getting more focused on the segment so i think this will really be interesting um, yeah no, that's exciting. Do you have a link or is there somewhere where people can kind of find the, um, these I can events? share a link with you. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that'd be fantastic. Well, we can link that to the blog post and uh, in the description of all the podcast recordings. And, uh, we, you know, we have listeners from all over the world. So, uh, you know, you never know where the where the listeners will be. Maybe they're just down the street and they'll be able to to join you. Um, cool. but yeah, thanks again so much for, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Elsa. Also to everyone tuning in, I hope you got some inspiration from the conversation today. Uh, keep your sights on this powerful leader as he drives ideation around all these fast growing technologies. You can find Julian uh, and his company on LinkedIn uh, or directly on the yeah. Ambulance Health Innovation website. 
Um, you can connect with me directly on LinkedIn as well. My name is Adam Olson, and I'm always happy to continue these conversations um, outside of the recordings. Um, thank you so much for being a part of the solution, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you, Adam.